so hi, I'm David. Um, so just a quick disclaimer. Uh, so a lot of, some people are allergic to cats. I'm allergic by the lack of cats. So I will cough sporadically throughout this presentation. Just a heads up. Um, cool. Uh, so this is a very obligatory like biography slide. Uh, this is really boring, so I added Doge. The kind of the sriracha of presentations. Uh, so I'm a developer by trade, but I've been doing more in the design and user experience world. So I've been kind of bringing in like UX and UI from a developer perspective. Uh, I help organize cr crypto parties in New York City, uh, Brooklyn, Manhattan, etc., Staten Island even at one point. Um, and kind of the foray that I've had into privacy enhancing technology or something was the thing that I called Haystack Haystack.ac, which is a thing that basically turns your Google search history into a big mess. There's a version on GitHub that kind of works on Chrome, but not really. Uh, I don't know why I put the so cypherpunk thing. Yeah. Oh, also I'm from New York. Cool. So here's kind of the typical story of what happens. Uh, there's been a lot more attention lately on a lot of privacy enhancing technology, namely a lot of things that use like crypt use crypto. Uh, so people have been wanting to learn more about it, about it. So people come to crypto parties. They're like, hey, I want to do this stuff. Like, you know. I want to be cool like little butchers. Uh, so, yeah, so they go there. Uh, also, exporting PNGs apparently gives it a white background by default instead of a black one. Uh, so, this is kind of the history of like what we're going to be talking about. Uh, since December 2012, when the first crypto party happened in New York, we've had like 24 of them, and they've kind of been everywhere. So, these are all different communities. They all have different skill levels, different sense, different areas of expertise. Not all of them are going to be like the holistic totality of security, um, cryptography, and the math behind it, and uh, operational security. Uh, so, so it's a mix. So you have hackerspaces where like these things end up kind of happening first because there's just enough of a crossover on Twitter between like hackers and the CCC and like Asher Wolf that it just like ends up happening. Um, so that's kind of the first audience. The, uh, there's been a few of them at like Off One, Fat Cat Fab Lab, which just had, recently had its relaunch, and my resistor, which I'm a member of. Uh, and a lot of people there are kind of more or less primed to the idea of like security and technology. So, but maybe less so on um, on kind of uh, usability, which I'll get into in a little bit. Libraries are kind of the, the different story. Uh, we've done a few crypto parties with the Brooklyn Public Library. Uh, and then Verso Books is not a library, but I added them in there because they've had a few things and it's kind of a similar environment. And that brings in kind of a cross kind of a cross section of everybody in Brooklyn. So not just like Williamsburg hipsters, but just like everybody, like people from like Coney Island and stuff. It's great. Uh, they deal with a lot of new internet users. So people that have never touched email outside of a web browser or like outside of an app. Uh, so the whole idea of like a protocol being what's actually behind the scenes this is a new thing. Uh, so it's important to know, like, remember, like, what people's mental, mo mental models are around, like, a lot of these systems. So people already see it as being end to end when it's really not. Uh, art galleries, just because like New York has them. Uh, Calix Institute is not in an art is not an art gallery. It's it's the Calix Institute, but it's inside an art gallery. Weirdly enough, because that just they have space. Um, Baby Castles is kind of this weird video game slash coding slash digital art cool space uh, that brings in like a lot of interesting folks. Uh, and they're kind of doing it just because like it's just an intrinsically like compelling thing to just be able to like have this technology that like you know takes galaxies of computers worth like of computing power to actually like crack. So uh, so they're coming in from a totally different perspective, not necessarily always having a specific case for it, but just like the coolness of having the ability to do that. Uh, co-working spaces are kind of a different story. It's kind of a mix of like, well, you know, I want to have, I just want to be more secure. The internet is like filthy and dangerous. Like, what do I do? Uh, so that's kind of their perspective. They're used to using technology that is popular for conducting business, but maybe not necessarily knowing the holistic view of just like what security means and all that. Uh, university is kind of the same kind of general issue, just like grad students being curious and there's free food. So, yeah. Uh, so I'm bringing this in from kind of a developer perspective, but uh, one of the best avenues for that, and kind of the first like place to start, I think. So the Macintosh Human Interface Guidelines are actually really great for more than just Macintoshes from like OS2 in the 90s. Uh, 
OST, not OST like the IBM OST, but like the second OS. Of, anyway, um, the first two chapters or so kind of go through some of the fundamentals of user experience and user interface. Uh, and these are all just very valuable lessons that I'll just kind of dive into, uh, and particularly some of the ones that like specifically deal with or have kind of issues with dealing with security software. So here's some key lessons. So we had this idea back in the day of like modelessness, of just like having the ability to have uh, do multiple things uh, without having to uh, switch between different modes. So like you have the ability to like you know print while you're doing something else and you know multitasking, etc. Um, the idea though is that like with security, you have a mix of modes, including the uh, I'm not even going to touch the VGA cable. The, uh, the fact that a lot of this stuff is actually built, you have the idea of modes between secure and insecure mode, uh, which are a little weird, because that's, that's a very unique case of when not even touching the table, uh, of something to keep in mind. And unfortunately, like this is a place where people can really, really mess up really easily if this isn't done extremely well. A lot of the crypto software that we have, or at least it's popular, is built on top of existing systems that were not inherently designed to be secure. Email, XMPP, these things were not designed to be end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, and because of that, we sort of built software that just piggybacks on top of it, thus creating a difference between a default and secure and a like extra secure mode. Uh, so yeah, this will uh, this will cut. Th it's something to think about, and there's very careful ways of like approaching that that I'll get into in a little bit. There's also the idea of perceived stability is. Um, Unfortunately, in the open source world, we tend to kind of code first and then kind of add a like a UI later. Uh, it's kind of a problem because the, really the user only sees the UI. Like they have no understanding of what's going on behind the scenes, or need for understanding of what's going on behind the scenes in some cases. Uh, but they do perceive that any like breaking that happens in the front end immediately translates to them as something that's broken kind of underneath the hood as well. Uh, so this is something that's particularly important in crypto because, like, if you screw up in your privacy, then it's kind of game over. So, if, if you want to make sure that if something is working behind the scenes but isn't on the front end, you want to make sure that the front end, the integrity of that, matches what's going on in the back end as well. Otherwise, the workingness of the back end is just not communicated. They're going to assume it's broken. Uh, user testing. Uh, so, there's a. Uh, it's a good idea to prototype your software. Uh, just like iterate. So instead of just like having one thing where it's like, all right, it's out, and then we're not touching it forever, uh, kind of go through as you add more features, dog food them on people, get them to use it. Um, at Hope, there was a great talk by Katie Nismith, which unfortunately there's only audio up on the Hope website, so you should check it out if you want to learn like how to use your tests. Uh, there's also the idea of metaphors. Um, this ties into greater UX concept of schemorphism, where it's like, Here's your contact book, but it's not a book. It's like a database inside your phone. Uh, but we use these things to kind of explain like what a thing does and what its function is in the way you use it. Uh, and unfortunately, this is really hard in crypto because we have a lot of things that are really ambiguous, um, or we reuse some things. Like Diffie Hellman created the idea of like public and private keys, but uh, that was just because like for like all of the history of humanity, if you wanted to send an encrypted message, you had to share a private key of some kind, or a private, like, cipher uh, key. So uh, so that sort of verb user is just, like, passed into it. So it's like, oh, well, you have a public key and a private key now. In the real world, though, like, you can't really do anything with two keys. Like, um, my colleague from Crypto Party Phoenix, Will Bradley, came up with the idea of having a lock, and then that is your, like, public key, and then, like, the actual private key is the key, and that makes more sense, because you can lock stuff up with your private key, with your public key. Or sorry, you can lock things up with your private key and then distribute the public key for anybody that wants to send you something that you can only unlock. Uh, we also, I also have issues with the term fingerprint as well, which I'll get into in a minute. Uh, so the more modern lessons specifically from cryptography software, just from like years of kind of basically user testing in front of accidentally side effect of user testing with crypto parties, is uh, there's an idea of like forgiveness in UX UI where you have the like ability to undo something to like, you know, if you make a mistake, it's cool. We'll just undo it. It's fine. It's you can't like if if you screw up once in in some of these in some processes within a lot of crypto software, it's just done. Like there is no undo. 
Uh, so that means that you instead have to like make sure that people know what they're getting into and kind of uh, have things in your UI that communicate what's about to happen to mitigate mistakes. Um, so another thing is just like having too many tools. Like we're looking at, say, like GPG, for example, that typical setup is that we usually prescribe is essentially on OS X, for example, is like GPT tools, Thunderbird, uh, Enigma. Um, and if you're doing, you know, checksums and all these things as you download them, it's, it's a lot in process, like, it, and it's tedious. That's probably why people actually, like, even though they've read about it and they kind of get the idea of what to do, they'll wait until they get to a crypto party before they actually attempt it because there's so many steps involved that they don't want to mess any of them up because, of course, crypto mistakes and crypto software mean uh, ownership. Uh, anyway, so that's kind of the idea there. That's a huge source of friction for a lot of things. Uh, there's also, I, I'm just calling this, it's totally made up term, false hope. Where if there is something that could go wrong, um, or a feature might not be available, it might not be what they're used to, it's a good idea to warn the user ahead of time, uh, just to like let them know. It's like the, the sort of digital equivalent of like the highway sign that has like cows or like goats or emus, where it's like, you might hit a cow if you come here. Uh, it's the same idea. You want to like kind of communicate what's about to happen, what what prerequisites they need before they get to the next step. Uh, and I'll get into some examples with that as we go along. There's also just like the fact that even if you have everything communicated 100% correctly and it's awesome and like there's no confusion, the internet will fuck it up. Like people will go home, do a DuckDuckGo search, and be like, I'm going to go look for XMPP and gain. And oh, this website from 2003 says I need to install Game. And game doesn't exist anymore. It was renamed to Pigeon, uh, and it's also called Jabber in that system, and not XMPP. So there's there's one of those things where like you have to mitigate the realities of the confusion of everybody else. Uh, kind of prime example of that is just like explaining what a fingerprint is, and then having analogies where it also could be called like a hash, for example. So actually, before I did this talk, I had this idea in the back of my mind that I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to actually start a Tumblr blog that was inspired from uh, readthefuckingheg.tumblr.com, which is all about like calling out bad design and Mac applications. Um, and I wanted to do that kind of with crypto software originally, but then I was just like looking at like how much that blog didn't solve, and like everybody like tweeted really hard, as snarky as they could, to try to fix the security industry and design, and it just didn't work. So, in the spirit of kind of uh, the sort of common themes of uh, civility and empathy that we want to perme permeate through the tech industry. I'm just offering basically constructive criticism on existing tools and then like going to their bug tracker or their GitHub. And through all these examples, except for two of them, because it's taken a long time for me to like come up with a good design for that, basically offering alternatives on like how they can do things differently, uh, which I'm going to go over right now. So this first example I never recommend in any crypto party because, uh, well, shady crypto. Um, but I'm going to bring it up for one great feature and one awful feature. Uh, specifically, when you're dealing with different devices, there's different contexts the software runs on. So, uh, you know, your crypto could be like awesome, but if the person on the other end can take a screenshot then, and then send it to somebody, then, you know, game over. Like, uh, and I guess copy and paste and things like that too. So it's one of those things that you want to mitigate to like discourage that. Uh, Crypt Telegram kind of does this by letting people know that they took a screenshot. Uh, also, I realize I'm going to blur out Wolf's name at the bottom, sorry. Uh, and the thing is, uh, there's also issues with kind of going back to the idea of modes, of knowing like whether you're in a secure mode or not secure mode. I have no idea why Telegram isn't just always in a secure mode, because they built their own infrastructure, they built their own everything, but maybe their like, crappy crypto doesn't let them, to let them do that by default. Uh, so people make this. People make these mistakes constantly. They're like this is secure, and it's like no, you didn't turn on OTR. Um, and so, can you spot like where, like what indicator, what tells you communicates to you in the UI, like whether one is encrypted or not? Like there is the tiniest like lock icon at the very top of next to the name, and that is the only thing that is like telling you like, by the way, this is end-to-end -end encrypted and not just like encrypted in transit. So there's a lot that could be done better there. And here's some examples of how to do it better. So Chrome does a pretty good job at this. Um, the, it, it's more obvious. Like you have this kind of like, you know, the top 
sort of like the way people kind of look at stuff top to bottom, left to right sometimes, but not necessarily. In this case, you could go both right to left. Uh, the first thing we'll see would be the top of things, in this case a window, and you're seeing that it's a different color than what the other windows are. It's different, and it has like a weird creepy fedora guy in the background. Um, now, in the in the forefront though, you see like something that will only be needed to be read once, and uh, basically that just kind of lets you know what's about to happen. Oh, yeah, for Hi, DEF CON. Who out there is this uh, first DEF CON? Wow, that's a lot of hands. All right, so I'm guessing that you guys have already seen this once today. <laughs> for what, for uh, those of you who don't know what's going on, uh, we have this tradition for first-time speakers. Uh, they uh, get to do a shot on stage with the goons. Uh, I thought we got to do shots on stage with them. <laughs> he has to. Everyone? Should he join in? Zero, 84, yeah. Fuck you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, go ahead. Cool, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, so we have the... Uh, uh, so we have a good example of, I think it's just something about the conductivity of... It made the screen turn on. This is good. Excellent. <laughs> Might be just something about the metal table. Just, I'm totally guessing. Uh. I'm helping. <laughs> Management. So yeah, so Chrome in this case has like a little message in the front that you saw earlier. So it kind of tells you just like what's going on. And what specifically this covers? Like, it's not. It doesn't tell you you're about to enter like onion router lands or anything. It just says like specifically, you know, we're not going to store cookies, except for this session. Uh, this doesn't protect you from your employer, etc., or anybody that has access to the network. It's something that you only had to read once, and that's why it's kind of in the background and out of the way. So it's useful the first time, but it's still there for anybody that needs it. Um, so it's just a good thing to have. It's it's a good design, I think. It's out of the way. It's there. But, uh, cool love. Okay, cool. Thanks. Another good example is actually Tor Project. So the Tor browser, like, happens in this completely distinct window where, like, inside of it, you're in, like, anonymity, like, crypto utopia, and outside of it, you're back in, like, surveillance land. Uh, so that's kind of the idea there. The, uh, and I think that's a good design to just have a totally separate window and just like not screw around with anything outside of that. Uh, in like militaries, you see the idea of like here's a computer that's like the red computer, the hot computer. Here's one that's like safe to use. Uh, so you have like two different devices, and that makes it so that it's less easy to make a mistake on be like, whoops, I did this on the wrong, totally different machine, uh, versus like, oh no, I did this in the wrong window. I didn't have like my socks proxy set up or whatever. So. This is one way to do mode really well. This also tells you like kind of how it works, uh, kind of next steps, um, uh, and that's kinda, it's great. It's it's good that it explains things. Uh, on the opposite end of not explaining things, this is an old version, so just a full disclaimer: like this has all been fixed. But uh, a release of signal like back in January, like can be kind of ran into some problems with people where it was like, yeah, there's a mystery blue button and nobody knows what it does. People were afraid to touch it. Uh, like, please label things. Like, it's one of those things where I know, like, sort of, the sort of, like, beauty side of design tends to favor things that have, like, you know, very minimal text, very minimal everything, and just have, just sort of copy an apple on their industrial design. Uh, but when it comes to things like this, you really want to mitigate mistakes, and because of that, you want to make sure that people know what they're getting into specifically. Uh, and uh, also, kind of another thing that you see in the design world is just like let's take this number of steps and turn them into two steps or three or like as as few many steps as possible. 
so it made it so that you can just have a contact call on like two steps, just whoop, and then tap. Unfortunately, though, it doesn't give you the option of like asking you whether you actually want to call them. So like pretty much three out of the four people that tried this the first time like accidentally called somebody uh, without realizing it was just going to go through. Uh, this was also fixed. Now it does what it expects. The other thing is also uh, going back to the theme of false hope. Uh, Signal runs their own like it's not using the telephone system like the traditional voice telephone system. So it doesn't necessarily need like an iPhone, so it was installed on my iPod Touch, but then it said it couldn't, and then it just kind of didn't have a thing to say no. Uh, it does now, and actually it just works on, I on the iPod Touch, which is great. Um, but it is one of those things where like you want to deal with these kind of cases and like yeah. um, make sure people understand right away like what they can or can't do before you like say, go follow these steps, by the way, you can't do anything well. Uh, this is going to be a recurring thing to a few other software packages. Uh, currently, and this is like under GitHub, so this is this is being looked at. Uh, there's the idea of a call button having like a corded phone. Like, I'm old enough that I remember using a non-cellular phone and what those like were shaped like, including the rotary phone. Like I said, I'm 30. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's one of those things that just might be like a far future concern, like post millennials. Like, if people stop watching 80s movies, then people might not understand this weird like half C shaped thing is a phone. Just something to think about. Uh, the other thing too is just like, uh, it's a good idea to explain what different features are. Um, incognito mode did this of course, uh, and you know, your mobile device can too. So like there's a thing for screen security. This actually specifically is like, if you do the like expose thing in iOS where you're like tabbing between applications, that actually takes a screenshot of what you're doing um, and then kind of saves it in like memory ephemerally. But in this case, it doesn't say that that's what this protects from. So it actually just like, when you do the expose thing, and it just has a blue overlay, which is great. Uh, so the screenshot is just like this blue screen with the logo in the middle. So yeah, explaining what it is is great. And it's really not hard to do, I think. I'm not an iOS developer. Uh, and there's also this, so here's the deal with fingerprint. So I, I've kind of alluded to the idea of just like me not liking, like using fingerprint and phrasing, especially with mobile apps, only because like in the context of where a lot of people are using these in New York, these are people that have been arrested or protests and they've had their fingerprint taken. In the back of the mind, their mind, they have this idea that yes, there is a, a, a way to like make this thing that was ink like into a digital thing. And it's like, is that what that is? Like iPhones have a fingerprint reader, reader built into them. So the context of where this is happening is a little bit different. So that is something that has literally been tripping people up as far as like what that means. There's also just no explanation of just like what it's derived from or like why it's useful or like how to use it. Um, so if you're gonna use that, I would recommend like saying like how, how it's useful um, and like how it's like, oh, it's a mathematical hash of like whatever, depending on the protocol. So uh, yeah, so fingerprint. I don't. I don't like that analogy, uh, with especially with mobile. So going back into the theme of like kind of systems that have their own infrastructure, uh, this is this is great. This is awesome because like if you have that ability to just have only a secure mode and just have it run in the background and not have to think about it, it makes it so you can't make the mistake of like, whoops, I accidentally sent this in plain text. Uh, so Peer is an example of this. There's others, of course, uh, which I'll get into. Um, there's a few issues that we ran into, which I'll get into in the next slide. Uh, one of which is like, you have to add a contact before you can send a message to them, but that's not necessarily communicated well. And it looks so much like email that people just assume it works exactly like email. So like people will post like their Pirio handles under Twitter or whatever, it'd be like, this is my Pirio, like username. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go send somebody a Pirio message and I can't. The other thing too is the idea of, so another thing that is, that is fantastic is it makes uh, what I would consider better passwords in terms of using passphrases that are just really long instead of like tiny, like weird things that are hard to remember. This is great, but there's also a short pin thing that lets you, if you're on specifically, that will only work on that device, let you enter a short pin. And if you don't, it's kind of like a muscle, I guess. Like you, if you don't exercise that long passphrase, like people have been kind of forgetting them over like the course of a week or so. Um, so, there's ways of testing for that. Uh, I did a really weird project where I tried to use images for a pin that only worked on a local LAN at the last place that I worked at. The way we user tested before we wrote a single line of code is we took a giant piece of cardboard 
and placed a series of 12 baseball cards, 12 Pokemon cards, 12 World of Warcraft cards, and 12 like weird animal zoo cards from like the Netherlands. And uh, we went around the office and we were just like, pick your favorite one and we'll write it down. And then like a, week, a few days later, we'll be like, which one did you pick? And then a week later, it was like, which one did you pick? And then like a month later, three months later, they all remembered. It was awesome. That's just the only reason why we went forward with it. Um, I think phrases could be done the same way, but I think there is a sweet spot of when people start forgetting. Uh, so similar user testing, doing things that way will, I think, be great in helping people, helping figure that sweet spot out, I think. Because there is kind of an average that can come in and play on that. Uh, this is kind of just what I was alluding to earlier. Again, this is on their radar. This is something they're looking into. Uh, so this is just like what I did instinctively, um, what I think one other person did at a crypto party is. It's like, hey, I have their username. Let's write a message. What happened? Oh, no, I don't have recipients, but I have one. What do you mean it doesn't? Um, so it's, it's one of those things where like, you kind of want to let them know. This is a prerequisite step for the, you give them the false hope of continuing and then not being able to actually do a thing, especially after you put work into it. Uh, so here's the downside of a lot of these kind of systems that have their own like infrastructure that doesn't piggyback on insecure legacy systems is every investor wants their horse in the race as far as like the new messenger app. We like, totally want to go after WhatsApp or whatever. Um, and almost none of them are interoperable. Like nobody's going to install like eight secure messaging apps on their phone and then want to remember like what contacts are and which one. Uh, so everybody's just counting on network effects to so just come into play and be like, everybody's going to use, you know, SureSpot or whatever. And there are standards. And I would encourage any developers out there to like use standards. Uh, of course, Signal has a lock. So all mini lock is a uh, curious thing, uh, but can be used by other things. Uh, OTR, of course, is used. PGP is also used. Let's talk about OTR. So. Here's the thing that's just always the thing that comes up in every crypto party, despite having like kind of a lot of other secure messaging options. But for desktops, it's actually kind of sparse. We have an OTR plugin for a DM for, or sorry, for a pigeon, and then we also have a DM which also has support for that. Um, the thing is, the way this is communicated is a little weird. It's uh, people are like, "Hey, let's go download OTR," and they go to their phone and like look for OTR. Uh, so, but that really means like, oh, you have to use something like Chat Secure, a different client, and you have to be, it's different depending on what platform you're on. Um, and it's called, the actual protocol behind the scenes has to be called different things. You already have to have an account, or in some cases you can create one, but sometimes there's not an easy way to do that built in. Uh, cats. And so, yeah, basically the, uh, and then you need an XMPP account, and sometimes some of the providers don't have them. Like, Sign certificates, so that just ends up looking weird, and it just it always ends up sketching people out. Uh, so this is what the pigeon interface looks like now. We kind of like have people use, uh, and so Thunderbird has this. They have an onboarding process where if you like over Thunderbird for the first time, you can just set up a new email account with like Gandhi or whatever. Uh, pigeon unfortunately lacks this. Uh, it's something that I would like to see built in. I'm working on designs in like GTK on like how to do that, and. Uh, so you have to kind of already have an account, or if you know the server that you want to connect to, you can create a new account there using this. But it's also weird because it's like, it's the same interface, like it's like one of those things that's like probably really efficient in the code where it's like the same display used for the edit screen is also the same for the create screen. Uh, but you have this like persistent checkbox at the bottom, like even if you're like just tweaking your like microphone. You still see it, like you create an account on the server, but it doesn't belong in that context anyway, so why is it there? Um, so I would recommend moving that out, and I'll get into a good example of how to do that below in a second. Um, yeah, and then there's just like uh, issues with like the fact that it's just a very alien way for a lot of people to do things that they would normally do, like how do I reset my password? Um, and then just things that are kind of a throwback to what old IM things used to do, but don't really make sense in this context, like mail notifications. There's also just a mix of like different things that are related to security or privacy being thrown out in kind of similar contexts, uh, which we'll see in like PGP as well. Uh, but yeah, there's just not too much of, there's not a very distinct way to distinguish like transit security versus end-to-end -end security, uh, which I think is something that really is a new thing that people should think about. 
Um, and I don't know how to communicate that visually well, but it's something that I'm interested in tackling. Uh, and the UOTR settings, of course, are in a different place because it's a plugin, so it works a little bit differently. Um, and the install process is a little different too, because you have to install two things. You have to install Pigeon or ADM, and you have to uh, install the OTR plugin, etc. So it's just already like now you're just installing more tools, and it's different in other places. Like if you're using Debian, you have like you can just app get install it and have a signed copy of that binary like available. Whereas in other things, you just like checkbox install, cross your fingers. Um, and then people are like, hey, why don't we have this built in? Yay, awesome, 2013, let's do it. Snowden, and then like afterwards, people were just kind of like, yeah, thumbs up, and nobody's done it yet. It's, uh, so it's 55% there um, as of May and also July. Uh, so we'll see how far that goes, but it looks like that will be available on the Pigeon 3.0 release, which I'm looking forward to in five years. Um, so there's Chat Secure, which is a really great example of how to do this. Uh, so this has a very distinct thing to like be able to say, do you have an account? No, let's create one and just have that be available right away. Uh, it's very easy to just kind of jump in immediately and just start using it, which is good. Uh, so this is basically what it could be. Like you don't have to like memorize what the URLs for these different things are. And it's like, oh, is it ccc.com? No, it's de. It's like, uh, is it duckduckgo.com? No, it's not. And you see everything right there, which is great. There's a few presets. You can add your own though. You still have the freedom to do that, which is awesome. Uh, and then there's some good defaults on our sort of encryption, a few other things. This is a very good user experience. Like this is basically the user experience that uh, other OTR enabled apps should use. Uh, so let's let's take it up a notch. So let's talk about PGP, which like Ikaruga, it's basically like if you ever played Ikaruga, then you, you know what PGP is like. Um, usability has been talked about in PGP actually for a while. Uh, good recommendation is why Johnny can encrypt, uh, which my colleague Trammel recommended in the audience somewhere. Uh, which is great. So this talks about 1999 issue, like issues from 1999 regarding PGP. Uh, some of them we actually still run into, just one. Uh, some of them have been solved actually quite well. Uh, but yeah, they actually did user testing with a specific audience of like, I think maybe 12 to 24 people and like two of them were able to successfully do everything properly as far as like sending your encrypted email to the other person. There were confusion at other points, uh, which I'll let you look into by downloading that paper at some time. Okay, so the thing with PTG is like you already have like too many moving parts, you already have them installed too many tools, kind of what I alluded to earlier. Uh, this is just like different, the popularity of different platforms doesn't necessarily line up with what volunteers know. Like for some sort of reason, there's a huge crossover between security privacy and the BSD group. So at any given crypto party in New York, you'll have more people that know how to install PGP on BSD than you do on Windows. Uh, and because those interfaces are different, like it's hard to like help them out on like, well, in open PGP tools, it's like this, but in here, it's like this, and just, nobody really knows for sure. People are afraid to do things because if they make a mistake, they're fucked. Um, so, and the order of things is also something you have to explain because like people just aren't used to the idea of email as a protocol, and it's like, oh, you have to set up your email account first and then install this. So Enigma is part of Thunderbird, but then Enigma has to be able to talk to your PGP install, so you have to do that. Um, and even internet users just have never like looked at email outside of a website or an app. So it's just something that has to be considered into play. It's like you're not just introducing end-to-end -end encryption to them and PGP to them. You're also introducing the idea of email as a protocol to them, uh, which is weird. And also like people that have been having that have had a Gmail account now for like ten years. Uh, you know, IMAP's the default, so it's just going to try to download everything. That uses up the internet connection. It's slow, and you can't actually like do things while you're that's happening because it just chokes up the CPU so bad that you can't actually do it. So it's a good idea to like take advantage of threading for different processes and have things in the background run while things in the foreground can happen. Uh, of course, that wasn't the way email always was. Like Pop makes it so that you can have it so that you're not downloading your entire email history on the server. You're just getting email as it comes to you. The idea of like one email landing in one place that you checked and a different email landing in another place that you checked and having those not sync across devices in the modern age, like after the 90s, is something that people are just terrified by. It's just a box for no. All right, and the other thing too is just like the stack that we're counting on as far as like Thunderbird, like the cross-platform like thing that we can tell everybody to use in Windows, Linux, or Mac, uh, or OpenBSC, is uh, is basically abandonware at this point. Like they're doing bug fixes, but there's not going to be any design changes happening anytime soon. Um, and there's like, just little things like that people don't think about, like set text sizes and like the resolution of displays and things like that, and how small that gets. 
Uh, so it's important to like accommodate for the idea of really big screens because even if you don't think that your email app is going to like show in Times Square, the resolutions of your screens are only going to get stronger. And so that that's something that's going to have to be thought about. Uh, there's also now that you indicate the subject line is not encrypted. There's also something that was brought up in the 1999 paper on why Johnny can't encrypt. Uh, there are ways of kind of highlighting things within like those text boxes. You do that for the two PGP does that for the two to let people know. It should also do it for the subject line, in my opinion. Uh, kind of like what it does here, where you have like the two field, it's like hyphen red, um, because I don't have like signatures, the trust level is not high enough or whatever. And then you have the subject line, but nothing is indicating that's on encrypted at all. It's something that we literally just have to tell everybody individually forever. Uh, so we could just have something either highlighted red, and then you have a little thing that pops up to say, hey, this is unencrypted, the rest of the body isn't. Sorry, it's just the way 1970s design email. Um, then we also have this idea of multiple things, kind of like multiple types of encryption happening and like a little bit of confusion on explaining what each of those are. So the future is uh, not looking so good for that, but there's also the idea of like doing PGP in the browser, which has a few security issues, uh, but that's why it's an extension, not in a browser, but then browsers get hacked, but so do operating systems. So. Security-wise, I don't know. That's I'll leave that to all of you to figure out like whether that's an awful idea or not. Uh, there's a few people doing this. Uh, Yahoo, Google, Whiteout, Novelo, all basically doing kind of the same thing. Uh, I haven't even had a chance to use Yahoo or Google's thing. Uh, Novelo, or sorry, Whiteout.io, I couldn't use because it just kind of froze and I couldn't. I, maybe it did generate a key successfully, and I didn't know because the front end was working. Uh, so. This is what people do when they tell me, when they use an envelope, uh, they'll start writing a message. Uh, there'll be a little thing that pops up kind of in the very corner of that compose window. Uh, no text on it, just like a little thing that has like a little icon with a pencil or a piece of paper on it. Uh, and then as soon as you start typing, it disappears and doesn't come back. Uh, then you're like, all right, I'm ready to encrypt. Oh, wait, I can't. And then you open up the tab and it's saying that, or you open up the button and it's just saying that it's like, you can add a tab. What does that mean? And in this case, you have the ability to like add mobile apps to different web mail service providers, which is a useful feature, but like it's not in the place where people expect it. That would be something like an advanced settings or like a different thing. Uh, the other thing too is like your well, you can see but like the draft is safe. Like you've already typed in your secret message that you want to like say or whatever, and it's already done. Like there's no undo on that really in the age of Google like data retention. Uh, so that's the thing. It's like it should literally just stop you. It should have a different window composer, a composer window that should ask you immediately. It's like, is this going to be a secure message? It's like, do not start typing yet, uh, and then go for it. Uh, this is a complex design, especially to deal with in a web-based context where like you don't really have that much control of the UI. That's already pretty presented. Uh, but there are advantages. Like everybody already has a web browser. People are already familiar with how to use Gmail, Yahoo, or Yandex, or whatever. Uh, Chromebooks are just all over the place. Even like like. The uh, speaker room had Chromebooks. It was just everywhere. They're not going away. Um, there's also just the idea of just like PGP's fundamental architecture doesn't always work so well with the browser extension context where you have like things like terminal storage and like things like being wiped out. Uh, you know, extension caches, but that might include your private key, and then suddenly you don't have a private key anymore at all. Uh, and these things made sense back in the day. Like, I don't want to like diss on Zimmerman for creating something that made like total sense in 1991. Like, the idea is that like back then you had a computer, you only had one computer. You didn't have to worry about moving files around because you were just always on one machine. Uh, and it was in a locked house. You already had like you really had to worry about key security. You didn't have to worry about iCloud like copying your private key and giving it to Apple. Uh, that was just wasn't a thing back then. And just the idea of like key servers back then kind of made sense because you really have like secure like. A real strong way to like say, hey, here's how to announce my public key without securing it in transit, and you do now with HTTPS. Um, and with social media that also uses HTTPS, and multiple kind of outlets for social media where we can put public keys uh, in not only different websites but different jurisdictions that those websites live in. So if you have like your public key on QQ or Yandex, I am whatever, and uh, you know, Twitter, then you have to deal with like three giant governments that hate each other cooperating to like fork over your public key to like try to change all those basically. So it's, it limits the threat model a lot that way. And, and that kind of approach is something that I really like. Uh, the other thing you get is like RSA was already slow to begin with, with uh, prime factoring. And like even I think the GitHub issue, one of the GitHub issues that I saw on 
Google's end to end encryption involved like trying to like find out like how to make factory crimes faster. So they're looking at like Chinese mathematicians from like the ancient days and like how they did stuff. Actually, it's Sun Tzu, but not that Sun Tzu. It's pretty cool. Uh, so that's just one of those things. Like, do we need private keys to be files? Like, can we just have them like determine der like derive like deterministically from a hash of the public key with a long passphrase, which is what Minilock does. Uh, that gets around the idea of like having to worry about file security, which people are just not good at. People will. I literally had people go into classrooms and not understand what a file was. Like, this is the age of like iPad apps. So it's it's scary, but it's also something we need to like deal with. Um, and like I said, like social media kind of helps with the what key ser the, the function that key servers basically used at one point. The way like what key base is doing, I think, is extremely compelling. Uh, that's just newer, fast performance encryption. Like ECC actually runs really fast in JavaScript. Um, RSA not so much. Uh, yeah, and that's basically my talk. Uh, these are my Twitters and website. Curio. Don't forget to add me as a contact first, and I have to approve it, and then that's when we can talk. Uh, public key ID, wall, uh, fingerprint, and uh, also for any of you that are working on these tools uh, for open source, check out simplysecure.org. A lot of people running it behind the scenes are really great. Some of them have taught me some things about user testing, so they're kind of like they're they're good people to talk to. Uh, and like I said, check out that hope talk that uh, Katie did. Um, yeah, that's it. Any questions, comments, ideas, concerns, rants? I have no idea where the microphones are for Q and A, but they're they're around, I think. So the question was, do you think it makes sense to keep working on PGP or just kind of like let it, like send it to the goo factory? Um, I think a lot of people are already using it. It's one of those things like email where I think it, it'll it continue to exist whether we like it or not. So we might as well come up with ways to like have them use it in a way that makes sense. Some of the things that I was thinking about specifically for PGP is the idea of like, well, what if you treated file security the way you would with a key like for a door um, and it's just a thing that you carried with you. Like, do you really need your private key on the computer that you want to use it with? Uh, we have like ARM-based computers that can like live on a USB drive, and I wonder whether that could just be like a super locked down PGP like computer that you carry with you, and then just plug in via USB to the laptop that you want to use PGP on, or NFC to the mobile device to just like be able to say like, hey, encrypt this message. Um, actually, not even do the encryption on the machine that's on your like user device, but the actual PGP computer, and just have it like send in plain text, give you back cipher text, and then just have it do the delivery from there. And that would help solve, I think, a lot of usability problems in area as far as like file security, having to think about backup software, like all these other things. So that's one approach that I think works. Uh, the other is just like better desktop software. Um, Mailpile seems like it's promising and doing well for that. But again, as long as private keys remain as files. Um, you're either going to have to have that file in like one place really secure, or you're going to have to like learn and become a security expert. So, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you.